Okay, welcome back everybody. Today we're going to go over the likelihood principle. Um, I would say principles just in general, I would say arguing on principle alone is not a good enough thing to do when you hear somebody say that they're arguing on principle. It's a guiding light. It's an idea. So I think you need more substantial things than just guiding lights. But the likelihood principle and the example that I'm going to cover is concocted to show you certain things might be bad ideas and you need to give it some real thought So before you just employ things. The punchline of this is going to be that looking at tail probabilities and averaging over them, tail probabilities, i.e. p-values, things can go wrong. So this will be our first discussion on what could go wrong with a p-value. This is one such argument. We'll be going over that a little bit more when we get into chapter eight. So this is just a prelude to that. Um, the likelihood principle says if I have two different data sets, X and Y, and you can think about those data sets either as the same data set with a conceptual difference in understanding the probability model behind that data set, or two different data sets um, with two different sizes, but this relationship is true. So you can either think of it as the same data set with maybe two different conceptualizations. Um, we'll talk about that through this example. It'll be the same data with two different ideas of what the boundary conditions are. Or two different data sets such that the likelihoods are proportional to each other. So the book writes it out like this. If two likelihoods have this relationship, I always kind of wanted the, the book to say this is like two different likelihood functions and denote it like that. Um, the book doesn't do that. They just say you've got two different likelihoods that are conditioned on different data sets. So if you want to call one likelihood X and likelihood Y, and that makes you feel better, you can do that. Um, all this really says is that you have two different likelihoods that are proportional to each other. We form a likelihood function just by taking the sampling distribution, plugging in the data, and thinking of them as functions over the parameter space. So I've already said a lot about this. This basically says that the likelihood functions have the same shapes, then your inferences should be the same. And we've seen a concept like that before. So I've alluded to that. I've said that before. That seems to be the information, what the shape of a likelihood is. Um, but in some sense, I'm a likelihoodist. You know, so I kind of just believe that, that if two likelihoods have the same shapes, they should be supplying the same information. Of course, that doesn't tell us what we're going to do with the likelihoods. So this statement about the likelihood principle says if two likelihoods are proportional to each other, i.e. they're equal to each other and there's some constant that we, can, we invoke to make this equal, and I kind of always said, those normalizing constants aren't important. We usually chuck them and just write this stuff where we say the likelihoods are proportional to each other. Where have I mentioned that concept before? That if two likelihoods are the same. Okay, so you're thinking Bayes right away. And that is probably where the argument is directed, where people come up with this, is that if we use the same priors, then we would come up with the same inferences. So that would be an implementation of how you interpret the likelihood principle if the two likelihoods are the same. If we are Bayesians and we all agreed on the same way of coming up with a prior, i.e. maybe some limit of a conjugate prior, then our inferences would be the same. So if we agreed on the same prior rules, then that would at least be some implementation of this. I think that's too far. That's not what this says. It doesn't tell you how to carry out the analysis. So you're thinking in the right direction, but you're taking it one step too far already. So I brought this back to kind of a more primitive concept without even invoking any Bayesian arguments. He's up. Where did I come up with this idea? If two likelihoods are proportional to each other before. Is yes, that's what I'm looking for. So the sufficiency principle has this in there. So when we ended up saying the ratio of these two sampling distributions, one on the test statistic, whatever the sufficient statistic is, um, compared to the probability distribution 
on the original data set, the ratio of that is a constant, i.e. it doesn't have theta involved, then um, the test statistic is the sufficient statistic. And so this is a statement about the sufficiency principle. So this idea encompasses the sufficiency principle. So I'm just going to write that down. The likelihood principle or likelihoods in general, they uh, invoke the sufficiency principle automatically. So good ideas about likelihood functions is they automatically satisfy the sufficiency principle. So if we accept this is true, then you automatically get the sufficiency principle out of this. So, and that's because we're conditioning on the data sets, and the data itself is the sufficient statistic. So, there's also another statement that likelihoods kind of, or another principle that likelihoods automatically, um, let's say this just a little bit different. The likelihood principle gives you another principle for free. I would say. So the likelihood principle gives us the sufficiency principle. If you accept that, you accept the sufficiency principle. But there's also one more principle in the book that they talk about. And the likelihood principle subsumes that principle. Anybody read the book yet? Ancillary. What's that? Ancillary. Yeah, it does also incorporate all the ancillary statistics. So you're on to something, but I'm looking for something more specific. So it incorporates all the statistics because you condition on the data set. Conditionality. Conditionality. So you're conditioning on the exact data set. So this also subsumes the conditionality. All this means is you've conditioned on the data set. I'm going to point out when we come to this example in a moment that p values don't do that. So, uh, a counterexample to the conditionality principle is p values, where you don't just look at your data, but you look at more extreme data. So, you're not conditioning on the exact data set, but you're also using more extremity from that data point as a proxy for doing inferences. And so p-values violate the conditionality principle. If you invoke the, if you um, derive p-values, I would say properly, you probably are going to be conditioning on a sufficient statistic. If you don't do that, you can be eaten. So and I think we all accept that. So likelihood functions automatically give us the sufficiency principle and conditionality principles that we're conditioning on the exact data set as opposed to more extremity, like a p-value does. Um, there's also other reasons I like likelihood functions, is if theta was high dimensional, it gives us a joint relationship between all of those parameters. So, and I like that as well. So that would be kind of my third pro of a likelihood function. So, gives us, Joint relationships of theta. If theta is high dimensional, so I'll kind of imagine that I've got some theta right here, and this has some dimensionality. The example that I'm going to focus on is a one dimensional problem, so. We can just get rid of that, I guess, for a one-dimensional thing. But I'd say likelihoods are cool because it tells us joint relationships about parameters. Um, here's the likelihood principle light. It is the likelihood principle, if you accept this, you get these two properties for free. The overstatement of the likelihood principle says if you subscribe to the conditionality principle and the sufficiency principle, then you have to adhere to the likelihood principle. And there's a proof in the book that says 
you can derive a likelihood principle from the sufficiency principle and the conditionality principle. I don't need you to read through that proof because I don't think it's correct. So Birnbaum's original proof in the 60s is certainly not correct, and they make a little asterisk statement in the book about that. And this has been going on for 40, 60 years now, that people say, here's a counterproof to the proof that Ber Birnbaum came up with, or the most modern proofs, and then people find an error in that proof. It's hard to believe that there's only one way to carry out these two things. So the likelihood principle light says, that likelihoods are a good idea because you automatically invoke the sufficiency and conditionality principle. I don't think it's an if and only if statement. And that's probably what we're arguing about. So I think the likelihood principle is a good idea, but I don't think it's an end all be all that you have to adhere to it. So, and I think that overstatement is brought about by the old school Bayesians that are saying if you don't do Bayes, then you've messed up automatically. And the reason that that's just probably um, an overstatement even for the Bayesian is that we have to agree on which priors we're going to use. And so and there's nothing that talks about that in the likelihood principle. So I've accused Bayesians that say that there are ardent likelihood principle lists is violating the likelihood principle and I've heard some pretty weak arguments where people say, well it's a minor violation. So um, so I, I've just seen way too much inconsistency. If anybody ever wants to come up and check out my book on the likelihood principle, you can, but you can't take it out of my office because it costs like $600 these days on Amazon. It's hard to find, it's out of print. Um, I think it has really good examples. Probably the best example is the example of the book that we're gonna cover. So I think the likelihood principle could maybe be accepted through a few examples, and I don't think we need the proof. But I do think likelihood functions are a good idea. So we'll just stick with that. So the overstatement is that inferences need to be the same if you accept that two likelihoods are proportional to each other. OK, I think that's enough about that. Um, well, maybe I, I should try to explain why this might be true. So imagine this. So, Here's just a quick example. So say I've got a likelihood function based off of x, and I determined that the likelihood of theta 1 is equal to 3 times the likelihood of theta 2. And I could interpret that. So and I did intend to make these both x. So same exact data set, so I have two points. You can think about these two points arbitrarily if you would like. But let's say this is true for two points that I've selected, theta 1 and theta 2. So what this says is that theta 1 is three times more likely than theta 2. So I have to multiply this by 3 to get it just as likely. So if I accept this statement as true, I can replace this with C of x and y. Likelihood theta 1 conditional on y. And this is going to be equal to 3 times C x y. Likelihood theta 2 conditional on y. So all I'm doing is just everywhere I see this likelihood conditional on x, I'm replacing it with that and plugging in the argument. So if that is true, then this is true. The c's cancel each other, and I'm left with the same relationship right here based off of the two different data sets, or at least the two different conceptualizations of the same data set. So, and that's easy to accept. So you would say the same thing. Of course, we usually don't walk around and just talk about the likelihood value itself. So likelihoods are self-relative. They're relative to, to themselves. And so you have to compare that function to itself. And it doesn't matter how you raise that function up and down, because we can multiply by any constant and come up with this same relationship. Okay. Let's go to an example. 
We're going to imagine two experimenters. They both come across the same data set, but they have two different ideas about the, the data set. So I'm going to show you what could go wrong if you don't adhere to the likelihood principle. So two experimenters. Okay, experiment number one. I'll tell you what they believe. Experiment number one is wandering around one day and they stumble across a data set. Oh, here it is. So they just find this. Oh, I want to do some inference on P. I see all of these heads and tails. So Bernoulli coin flips. I get to know what the mechanism for generating the heads and tails. So this is just a, a coin flip model. Everything is IID. And this is the data that I observe. And so and I have some ideas about this, and I have some ideas about how to do inference on P itself. But I have to make some assumptions on why this data set was generated with just 10 observations. So I'm going to agree with this. I'm going to agree that I've observed that. And then I'm going to make one minor assumption about this, that this data set was constructed by flipping a coin 10 times where 10 was fixed in advance. So experimental one believes n is 10, and that was fixed in advance. So I just made an assumption that didn't come with the data set that I found. Experimental two is going to believe something slightly different. So experiment two, wandering down the street one day, well, lo and behold, there's a data set. Sees the exact same data set, understands the mechanisms for sampling the bits, the heads and the tails, in here, and makes a different assumption. Sees that this last draw was a head, and they think that's not a coincidence. So, they imagine, experimental two imagines, that this data set was generated until the occurrence of the fifth head. Just as arbitrary. So, assumes data was generated until the occurrence of the fifth H. I think we could all agree that those are both perfectly arbitrary things. I think if you would say, no, n is equal to 10 is more natural, that's what I believe. You can just question yourself over the weekend and go, you only believe that because you learned about the binomial model first. So you're just more familiar with it. I've heard people tell me all kinds of things are natural, and it's usually just because they're more familiar with them. So experimenter one is saying that the data follows some binomial distribution, and experimenter two is saying that the data was generated under some slightly different distribution. But the fundamental mechanism for drawing the heads and the tails is exactly the same. So this distribution is binomial for experimenter one. So let me just write down what this looks like in binomial distribution for this data set is 10 choose 5, where that's the number of successes. That's the random variable. I've got P to the 5. So that's the random variable right there as well. And then I've got 1 minus P, 10 minus 5 number of failures. The random variable in a binomial distribution, you could either call the number of successes or the number of failures. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to arbitrarily call it the number of successes. So, and that's the sampling distribution. What sampling distribution is experimenter two of the week two? It's the negative binomial. 
Question. And if you're like me in early graduate school, you can't remember what the negative plan distribution is all about. So let me tell you what it's about. So it will derive its distribution real quickly with a picture. So let me just draw a picture real quick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So experimenter two is saying that was fixed right there. The last observation is ahead. Now, I would agree that experimenter two has no business assuming this until they see another data set. But they just stumbled across one data set and they can't verify this. So somebody told me this was true. I want them to verify it with another data set. Um, and then we can decide who's right. We don't get the opportunity to do this in this case. One data set, who knows how it's created. So you can be thinking about this maybe as DNA sequences. How did they come about? We don't know exactly. We have some ideas, but we don't know exactly the stopping criteria and some things. OK, um, so if you want to drive this distribution, you can think of this as I've got nine trials in here. And this has five failures and four successes. This is the fifth success right here. It's all the top it off right there. And since we agree with this mechanism, the order of all that stuff doesn't matter. Now I would agree that if all of these were heads right here and all of those were tails, there's probably something fishy with all of this. But the general assumption is that this could happen in any order, and I've got just nine trials in here, five failures, and four successes. This is the random bit. There's two ways to write down the negative binomial distribution. I can either talk about the failures being random or the total number of trials is being random. And so one is just a shift of the other. I'm going to use the formulation where I'm talking about the failures is the, the random variable. So be careful when you see different um, people to note the negative binomial distribution. They might be talking about a shift inversion. It will go back and forth between this so that we can start to understand which one is which, and it'll become just as natural to you as the binomial so, how is this stuff distributed, just in this batch of the data? If I make a statement like that, there's nine trials, five failures, four successes, any order. Binomial. That's the statement, a binomial statement. So this stuff, right in here, has distribution nine choose four, P to the four, 1 minus p to the 5. 5 tails. This part right here is just p. So that happened with probability p, and that was fixed. So I can rewrite this down as 9 choose 4. p to the 5. 1 minus p to the 5. This thing right here is 10 choose 5, p to the 5, 1 minus p to the 5. So they almost look the same. They're a little bit different. So if this chunk looks the same, if that chunk, that's the likelihood function. So this is a case where both experimenter 1 and experimenter 2 agree on the likelihood function, but they have different conceptualizations of the stopping rule which changes the normalizing constant on everything. So negative binomials and binomials look the same in terms of their likelihood functions. And if we adhere to the likelihood principle, experimenter one and experimenter two should come up with the same inferences. So if we want to imagine we're Bayesians and we like conjugate priors and we think there's good reason to use things like that, maybe limiting forms, or you like Jeffrey's priors, or you like reference priors, 
It turns out in this one dimensional case, all of those priors would be the same. And probably most Bayesians would run at this thing and use a beta half half. And if you want to know more about that, take my Bayes class in the fall. And I'll tell you where that beta half half distribution comes from. Um, it is a good idea. It's an optimal frequentist prior. So that was proved by non Bayesians. So we'll talk about that maybe when we get into chapter seven a little bit more and we, we go through Bayes. Um, ultimately, they have some minor disagreements. And the question is, is are there procedures where this minor disagreement will lead them to different conclusions? If you're a likelihood principle list, an argent one, the answer should be no. You should get the same inferences. I'll just kind of point out, I can write this down a little bit differently where this is 10 choose x, where that's the number of successes. This is p to the x, that's the random variable there. And this is 1 minus p, 10 minus x. So I can think about that distribution just a little bit more generally. And I can do something similar here. And I could end up writing this down as this is the number of, I'll write it down like this, x plus 4. So this is the number of values. Choose four. I could have chose X as well. I'll just put this down. So you'll see people flip this notation. It's the exact same thing. This is going to be P to the five. That's fixed there. That's the five successes. And then I've got one minus P to the number of failures. I'll call that X right here. If you want to change that to Y, go ahead and do that so that it kind of has that same flavor and setup. X means different things than these, these two different examples. I'll just do that, just to make things easier. So let's call that Y. Let's call that Y. So we have our notation match a little bit more what we wrote on the board the first time. So same data set, but different conceptualizations of that data set, different random variables that they're thinking about. Of course, there is a relationship between the random variables. Um, so slightly different distributions. So every time I ever want to derive a negative binomial, I just remember this picture. So I can always remember what a binomial distribution is, so then I can just draw this picture and come up with uh, the negative binomial. And always get it wrong. Cool. Okay. Let's imagine what can happen. If we liked things like hypothesis testing and p-values. So um, I will agree this is a little bit confusing the first time you see it. So think about this a little bit over the weekend. This isn't a hardcore class in writing down p-values and calculating p-values. I think we're all indoctrinated just a little bit where people say, well, you're supposed to think about stuff very carefully, but when we give you a test, we say, write down the null hypothesis, give me the test statistic, compute the p-value, and tell me the decision. They're turning you into a robot, so by doing that. And Naaman and Pearson would have said, don't do that. So think about the stopping rules, be very, very careful. So you need to think about everything that Wald said, and we'll get into that in chapter eight. So, um, so if you don't exactly understand how p-value works, Right now, or you've forgotten because your step 101 class was so long ago, I think that's okay. So we'll go through it in a little bit more detail as we get into chapter, chapter 8. Okay, so we're going to test some hypotheses. So hypothesis testing. This is the first time we're encountering this in this class. Um, this is my least favorite thing to talk about in all of statistics, and I'll get into more reasons than just this subtle reason as to why I don't like these, doing hypothesis testing. Here's the, in a nutshell, if I saw that data set and I agreed on this fundamental mechanism, I wouldn't want to do testing, I would just want to estimate P. So I think that's what we should be training people to do, is estimate P and tell me how uncertain you are about that regardless of how you think about this stuff. 
So I think that's a better procedure, but I get the Popperian view and we would like falsification because it follows the scientific method. So hypothesis testing. Let's just presume we want to test a null hypothesis, P is equal to P naught, versus some alternative hypothesis. And I'll call the alternative H alpha, and I'll say, if we don't like this hypothesis, we're going to reject it in favor of this other hypothesis. So that's the general setup. I'm going to try to be less contentious than I could in do the one-sided hypothesis test. So I will point out that one-sided hypothesis tests are much less contentious, and I usually will accept them more often than when I watch people do shark testing. So I really don't like this thing. So we'll talk about that later on in chapter eight, and we'll see that this is a less contentious test. I already believe that this can't be true. So no matter what P is, it's not P naught. You didn't pick the right P naught. You pick something maybe close to it. And so what we might be arguing about is how close do you need to be to P naught, P naught before we're willing to reject it. And what Bayesians <coughs> and frequentists kind of disagree on is the notion of closeness and what it means. So that's what they're arguing about. And so if you really want to have that argument with somebody, you have to understand both sides and what they're talking about. And we will talk about both sides, and I'll, I'll try to disparage them both equally. So. Okay, so I'm sure everybody's seen this in any high school stat class, they would have you do stuff like this. Um, anybody never seen this sort of setup before? Never seen a p-value calculation? Okay, good. So you would have astonished me. You've done this probably with normality or something like that. Okay, here's the two tests that the two experimenters would carry out. So experiment one. Is going to compute this P value. So their P value will look like sum over this function that we've written down. This is 10 choose x p naught to the x, 1 minus p naught to the 10 minus x. So you're going to condition on your null hypothesis, and then you're looking at more extreme data than, your null, than what you've actually observed. So we're, this is the part that confuses people usually, is which tail direction do we sum over to test that hypothesis? I would, what's that? The smaller one. The smaller one. So which one is that? What are the what are the bounds here? In this case it doesn't matter, but from five to ten. Five to ten. Exactly right. So Chris Conti has got this part. So sum up over five to ten, that's the more extreme stuff. I will point out that as P naught gets bigger and bigger, this P value will get bigger and bigger. So the idea is that if you assume this, and this number is extraordinarily small, then this has to be true. So P is probably greater than P naught if that's extraordinarily small. I'll point out that people have already gone through lots of arguments that the size of the P value doesn't mean anything. Fisher had a hard time swallowing that pill. And Naaman and Pearson tried to explain that to him and said what you really need to do is come up with the alpha level that's the important thing, and if P ducks alpha, then you make a decision. So, of course, Fisher didn't like that because he thought about degrees of belief and didn't want you to make sharp decisions. So, all that writing we've already heard about. So, uh, technically, if you're shielding yourself against air rates, you're supposed to pre-concoct alpha before you ever look at the p-value itself, and that's where the stars come from in these like automated programs. They tell you the significance levels among things. Um, we'll get into that later on. This is experimental one's p-value. Experimental two is going to look at a different p-value. 
Experiment number two's p value. So I'll call this p value one, and I'll call this p value two. This is going to be some sum over this distribution that we wrote down before. This is y plus four. Choose four. We're going to condition on our null hypothesis. This is fixed at five, and this was one minus p naught raised to the y, the number of failures. Same question, which tail direction do we sum over to test this hypothesis? Chris, one more time, can you impress us? It's the left tail. Yeah, it's the left tail. And that's because we're looking at the failures, which is the other side. So this is the left tail, where I'm going to sum over y is equal to zero, up to five. So that's the left tail. And if you want to think about that, it's because we flipped the random variable from successes to failures. So we sum over the other tail direction. If that confuses you, it confuses everybody. So basically, you're setting up a contradictory statement. Same thing is true if you want to go verify this. Is p not get bigger and bigger? In this p value over that tail direction, that p value will increase. So same thing will happen, same properties. The point is, is that these two p values are different. I would agree for some p naught, you could probably make them the same, but in general, they're not the same. So you can work through the algebra and convince yourself if you need to, or just plug in some numbers. These two numbers are different. So that could lead you to different inferences. And I think the 1980 Bayesian thought, boom, we're going to obviate p-values. We're never going to talk about these things again through this argument. And so all that ended up happening is people said, well, I don't subscribe to the likelihood principle. So it doesn't say I need to do that at all. Uh, I would agree if Naaman and Pearson came up with alpha levels and repeated this sort of experiment over and over again and had the right generation rules, that they would be calibrating the right error rates. So Naaman and Pearson would have a good argument and say, if you're actually just repeating this, and I just wanted to reject hypotheses, null hypotheses incorrectly, my type 1 error rate would be alpha. So all that stuff would be true if we assume the right stopping criteria. So, and Naaman and Pearson would be correct. It's just that most people don't do that. They look at the size of the p-value and they think it means something. So and it turns out that's just not true. If you want to think about that a little bit more, think about what you did in stat 101. If the p-value was a measure of belief, um, this wouldn't make very much sense. So if I did a one-tailed test and I came up with a p-value, it was p that I was basically testing one side of the real number line and I came up with a number p, that's called p star, and somebody said, oh, wait a minute, I want to test the sharp hypothesis where I want to just test at a point, not a whole side of the real number line. The p value would get doubled in size. So you'd multiply that p value by two. If the p value is a measure of belief, that shouldn't happen because now I'm testing at a point versus this infinite interval. And as I make the interval bigger and bigger, the measure of belief should get bigger. So not smaller. So I wish I asked that question when I was in high school. What does that happen if the p-value was a measure of belief? So in a sharp test, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Naaman and Pearson were coming in to try to explain what it could mean in their saying. Calibration of air rates, the alpha level is the important part. And unfortunately, they opened a can of worms that we've never recovered from. So we'll talk about all that stuff later. So let me just write this down. Point is, that these two things aren't the same. So, in general, p value one is not equal to p value. So, this is a violation. of 
key values violate the likelihood principle. Let me ask a more meaningful question. In which way are the key values violating the likelihood principle? Is it the sufficiency principle? No. The sufficient statistic for this is either x or y. Those are the right sufficient statistics. So it's the conditionality principle that key values are violating. So, and I do think that that's probably a big deal. So we'll get into that later on. So I'm going to just lighten the load on the likelihood principle and just say likelihoods automatically invoke conditionality and sufficiency, and those are two very good properties. So I would also agree that it depends on what you're doing. If you're running a conveyor belt and you really are in some frequentist regime where you're watching things happen all the time, I don't think the whole p-value thing is nonsensical. So, but I do think maybe it doesn't make sense if we only observe one data set and we can't recreate it, like we might with evolution in DNA. So it just is there. The reason it's there, we don't exactly know, and we can't just repeat the process over and over and over again. Let's just rerun evolution over and over again and see what we get. So that's preposterous. We can't do that. Um, so I would say if you're not in fully frequentist regimes, you probably want to think a little bit harder on how to do the inference and what it all means. The size of the p-value doesn't mean anything, and it shouldn't mean anything. Um, the alpha level is probably the thing that's mathematically coherent, and that does have some meaning. Okay, so that's the likelihood principle. As I said, I'm a recovering likelihood principalist. I used to believe this was absolute and people that violated it um, should be punished. So, and now I don't think that much. So I think we need to be more considerate and banning things like p-values probably isn't the greatest idea in the world. Um, we will go through some statements. If you want to get ahead, there are a couple statements from BASP and the ASA on p-values, and I put that on the course web page. So you can look at those if you want to just get ahead. But basically, there's a couple different communities and they fight with each other over the use of p-values. And we will have those discussions later on when we get into chapter eight. And then I'll tell you what everybody's talking about and where the argument is, which I think will be a little bit more useful than just hard. So um, we're gonna come back around and study ancillarity and I'll talk about completeness. So if you've done the homework, good job, bravo. Sorry that I've gotten you a little bit ahead on all of that. I'll give you one more gift. I'm going to extend the, the project one week as well. So you'll get one week push on that. So that obviously makes you very happy. Happy Friday. Mm -hmm. um, but let's talk about that homework set. The completeness problem is meant to be hard. I'll tell you what completeness is all about. But ancillarity and completeness are probably the two most useless things in all of statistics in terms of being a practical statistician because ancillary statistics have no information about the parameters things. So um, we'll talk about those. And you might think that those sort of statistics and sufficient statistics should have no overlap with each other. That's what Basu's theorem is about. And there's a condition, if you were Fisher, you might sympathize with them if you're trying to understand all of this these different statistics in this space and how they relate to each other is a mathematical question. It's all very interesting. So completeness is a condition that tells you that ancillary statistics are independent of sufficient statistics. And sometimes they're not independent, which means that there's a little bit of overlap between those two spaces. Um, nobody's ever asked me, well, is that an ancillary statistic or a complete statistic? What they really want is you use sufficient statistics. So that's the most important part of chapter six, is that you are using sufficient statistics. When we get to chapter seven, and we see route localization, it'll basically say if you are not conditioning on sufficient statistics, you can be beaten. And beaten means that you could come up with estimators that have less variability. So, and that's kind of what we want to control is the variability of what we're studying. So we're going to come back to that. It'll probably take us two days to cover, and then we're going to be jumping into point estimation chapter seven. That's it for now, you guys. Have a great weekend. If you do have the homeworks, feel free to hold on to them. If you do want to give them to me, I'm happy to take them as well. So it's up to you. My preference is you hold on to them. Is that okay? But Kimmy, if you want to hand it over, I'll take it.
Bobby. Okay. Oh, I gotcha. Thank you very much. Yeah. I really want to